I, I don't think anything in the world annoys me more than when people honk during a live show. It makes no sense. Like, I can't, I can just imagine people, I can just imagine people going home and being like, all right, let's turn on the five o'clock news. Let's see if, let's see if my honk's in there. Like, cool. But it's a honk. Anyone could take credit for that. Yeah. Hi guys, welcome to an episode of Broadcast Bulletin. I'm Jim Stanton. Jacob's not here today. He had a school project to work on, graphics to make for his newscast, so he's not here. You just got to deal with me today. It's my first interview by myself, but that's okay. Let's get right into the show today. Today's episode makes Broadcast Bulletin history because Matt Roy and Jordan Elder are our guests, but more importantly, it's more important because they're the. it's the first time we've had two people on at the same time. So not only are they both in the TV business, but at the time we're recording this in mid-February, they are at the same station in Springfield, Illinois. But they're gonna tell us today that uh, by the time you listen to this, that's not gonna be the case. So we're gonna find out where Matt is at now. And both are MMJs for the ABC affiliate in Springfield. And it's kind of a weird market, you know, champagne's also in there and all that. but. We won't bore you with that part. The two became best friends while working on their master's at Arizona State. So today we're going to discuss their special relationship and how they both ended up at the same station right out of school. They'll also talk about what it's like being an MMJ, why they both chose news, where they feel the industry is headed, you know, MMJ safety, because that's definitely been something of a topic lately and a lot more. So this new phase, which starts on May 14th, bridges the gap between phase four and phase five. Right now, the capacity at restaurants, museums is just 25%. John, we've been hearing from Springfield residents that houses often sit abandoned in neighborhoods for decades. This new bill would give the city power to reclaim more of those properties in less time. Nearly 11 months ago, the state shut down, but unemployment went up. Hundreds of thousands of people jobless almost in an instant and some for the very first time. But when they turned to the Department of Employment Security to get the unemployment benefits as a safety net, the state quickly realized that the net was torn. People may look at those moves and assume that we are cutting from the fire department and adding to police, but is that really what's happening? In the chambers, I'm Matt Roy. Back to you, Marcella. Reporting in Springfield, I'm Jordan Elder. Back to you. So we're excited to have you guys this evening. How are you both doing? Good. We're excited to be here. Absolutely. Weirdly, you guys only interview one person, and there's two of you, and now there's one of you and two of us. So. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, still three people, you know, so it's still a trio, so. It won't be too monotonous, I don't think, but let's ask the first question. So ladies first, Jordan, tell us about when you knew you wanted to get into TV news. So the Spark Notes version, when that bug first hit you up until, you know, your career now. I would say the news bug hit me when I was seven or eight years old. My babysitters uh, growing up in Kansas City would always watch Good Morning America when we were getting ready to go to school. So I would sit in the kitchen and watch with them. And I loved how much fun it looked like they were having. And I knew that I wanted that to be my job to do something fun every day, talk to different people and make a difference and tell stories. Okay. So you knew up until college, basically you wanted to do it. Yes. So I was such a broadcast nerd growing up. I did the middle school newscasts in high school. Um, I got really into it in college and was turning stories for our college news station. And I can't imagine doing anything else, honestly. Was there anybody like you watched on the local news there or national news that you're like, I want to be her or him growing up? Diane Sawyer was my first one. I know she she was the spark for a lot of people, but the way yeah. that she interviews and can be so compassionate, but still press and get the answers that she's looking for. I really admired her growing up once I understood more about journalism. Uh, and in Kansas City, there are a lot of reporters and anchors that have been in Kansas City yeah. for years and years, and they really do care about the community. And so it was really fun getting to watch them as I grew up as well. All right. So we're going to circle back to college here in a minute, but Let's, how about you, Matt? When did you know you wanted to get into TV? I think you have a very different story than Jordan, right? Yeah, I never knew I wanted to be on TV um, for a long time. I, I always thought that I wanted to do print for, um, for a really long time. I played, played basketball in high school, played football in college, and the only reason I wanted to be on TV was to by playing sports, not by telling about them. So I wanted to be in print that's where my bachelor's focused and then I was like you know 
I should really try and do everything. So then I started trying to go more into broadcast when I was done with football. And that's when I went to Arizona State to get more of that broadcast background. Um, and then that's when I started going into that direction. But I really didn't know. I didn't watch. I wasn't like Jordan. I didn't watch the local news growing up. I watched Sports Center, PTI, you know, Around the Horn. Uh, Mike and I was up at six watching Mike and Mike in the morning when I was a kid because I'm a nerd. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to go into local news. I didn't even really know what local news was until I got to college. So. Okay. So you guys both went to Arizona state. Uh, you both had different paths though. So I'm going to ask why you both chose that particular school, but let's start with you, Matt, cause you did take a different approach to going to Arizona state. So kind of talk about your college career. You were just at community college, right? Yeah. So I got done with high school and I had like a two seven GPA it was not good I was just trying to get the heck out of high school let alone um being there so took a year off after high school and went to go to a commu the community college that's in my um in the valley where I grew up college of the desert in Palm Desert California played two years of basketball there started getting into communications and then I got a full ride scholarship to uh, Fort Lewis College in Durango Colorado where I started investing more into journalism and multimedia studies which is what my uh, bachelor's was in, but that was, like I said, that was all basically digital. And so I got a little bit of play-by-play -play experience, a little bit of game calling, but not a lot of broadcast. So afterwards I was like, you know, I haven't done any of this. I think it was, and Fort Lewis College, prestigious journalism school. It's not like I could go and get a job right away. And I'd be, they'd be like, ah, yeah, I know where that is. Yeah. for sure that's a really good degree you have now it's it wasn't like that so I was like okay where else how can I expand that and learn but also go to a prestigious school where people could look at my resume and be like okay you went to Arizona State you went to Syracuse you went to one of these schools and and they would respect the knowledge that I'd gained which is when I started applying to master's programs and Arizona State is obviously a top five program I wasn't going to invest that much money and that much time into something that wasn't going to help me get where I wanted to go. So that's why I went to Arizona State. Sure. Okay. So for you, Jordan, I know we mentioned this when we talked previously, but you grew up in Kansas City, as you mentioned. So Mizzou's right there. So why did you end up going to Arizona State over Missouri or you know other schools? So the Mizzou Mafia is very strong. Um, I'm pretty sure they call themselves the world's first journalism school, which is really cool. Um, but I had toured Mizzou and I liked it, but I didn't love it. And so when I toured Arizona State, I really did love it because they are more broadcast focused and they have a great program for that. They partner with Arizona PBS. So you're doing real newscasts that people across Phoenix, Arizona can see. And there's a lot of mentorship involved in that. People who have come from huge news outlets across the country come back to teach there and uh, kind of give you that knowledge that they learned. And I knew probably since I was a sophomore in high school that I wanted to go to Arizona State. And once I toured it, it was absolutely over. Um, I, knew, I knew that's where I had to go and so did my parents. We had kind of talked about Syracuse, but my parents really liked that there were direct flights to Phoenix. There weren't direct flights to, to Syracuse, New York. And with Mizzou, my mom really was pushing for me to go there, but I liked that Arizona State was such an inclusive environment for journalism. I feel like the industry is not at a place where they should turn people away. I think we need more people. We need all types of people. And Arizona State was very inclusive. If you knew that you wanted to do journalism, they would teach you. Mm -hmm. And they didn't try to weed you out or make it really difficult. They, If you had the passion for it, they wanted you to learn. And I really respected that. And I think that our industry will be better for that. So I ended up going there for my bachelor's and my master's. I did a three plus one program. So I was able to keep my scholarships for my year of master's and kind of really work on honing my TV presence, telling stories and getting in before I went out into the real world. Arizona State's just second to none. Yeah, it's my, really great. In my opinion. Okay, so do you guys feel like because you have your master's, I know most people go from bachelor's or straight into the business. You feel like because you have your master's, it kind of gave you an edge over. Did you learn something from your master's that maybe you didn't learn otherwise? Personal, personally, I felt like I needed one because I didn't have that broadcast experience. So even if I went back to get another bachelor's, I needed more experience in broadcast journalism because I didn't have any. 
I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know how to how to dress. I didn't know how to write scripts. I didn't know how to do any of that. I basically learned all of that in a year and a half at ASU. So for me, I personally needed it unless I was going to go into print journalism, which is a dying industry right now. So yeah. sadly, because print journalism is awesome. But. I feel like it made me better. I don't know if I necessarily needed it, but it gave me more practice. Um, I got to do more stories and learn more things because I had that extra time mm -hmm. to do it. I think had I not done it at Arizona State, I don't know if I would have done one or if I would have waited a couple years to go back to school, but I am very glad that I did it. I think it's cool to be able to say that I have a master's, but I don't know if like long term down the road, I don't know if it'll make a difference to have a master's as opposed to just a bachelor's. Okay, so while in school, did you guys hold any internships and how do those prepare you for the job you're doing now? I had internships at 12 News in Phoenix. I was actually working on their lifestyle show because when I started out, I thought it, I thought that I wanted to be in entertainment news because I love the drama. I love the Kardashians. I love all that stuff. There are kind of jobs in that though. Like there's not really like Kardashian reporters. So I transitioned into hard news. You'd from be really there. good at that. I would be really good at it though, if anyone needs one. But I, uh, that's kind of how I started was on the lifestyle program. And then I also worked with Arizona PBS doing documentary style shows as well. Um, I worked uh, at a class that was, uh, the whole class was producing a documentary about teen suicide in Arizona. And then I worked on a program called Catalyst on Arizona PBS that has won so many awards for their work in science journalism and taking those really complex topics and breaking it down to the point where people can understand and care about what people are discovering. Yeah, I mean, I took a much different path, obviously. So I didn't really have any internships or anything like that because I was working 40 hours a week while playing football in college. And then when, we, when I went to my master's program, I was working 40 to 50 hours a week while trying to get my master's. So it didn't, didn't really have time. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, do you feel like not having one? It obviously didn't hurt you, right? I don't think it hurt me, but I mean, it's all, it's all just more and more experience. You go in knowing more than other people, but I didn't really know how a newsroom worked or anything like that because I didn't have that experience. But I mean, you get that as you keep going. So I feel like I, I don't think I missed out on a lot of things. I missed out on making connections in those markets, um, like with 12 in, in Phoenix or 15 or any of those other any of those uh, of uh, any of those other stations yeah. you miss out on the connections with the anchors with the news directors with all that stuff so later on when you're ready to go to phoenix then you'll be like hey you know me right so i don't have that but that's kind of what you miss out on it's the networking angle of it okay, so did either of you uh, while in college have an industry mentor and would you say it's important to find a mentor I did. Cronkite actually, when I was a freshman, set us up with people in the industry who were doing the jobs that we wanted to do. And my mentor, her name was Megan Thompson and for ABC in Phoenix. And she was awesome because she really did. She worked in local news, came back to Phoenix, which was her home market. And she really does have a passion for it. And she's very good at what she does. So it was helpful for me in the first few years to have someone to bounce ideas off of and kind of get advice. And we've stayed in touch throughout um, college and my master's and starting this job. I, I texted her when I got hired in Springfield and she was really excited with me that it was like, oh my gosh, all your dreams are coming true. You're going to be a reporter. And so it, it was cool to have that connection. And I have other I would say that I have had other mentors over the course of, of doing journalism. I would shadow the journalists in Kansas City and kind of see what they did. And I think it is helpful, um, especially as you move up in the industry, but um, I've, I've been very thankful for my mentors. I honestly, I really don't have any. I, there's a lot of people that have helped me along the way with some advice here and there, but no one person that's that I've gone to repeatedly or one person that has kind of honed taken me under their wing or or anything of that nature all of the professors at Cronkite are extremely helpful and I text them texted them before I took this new job and before I took this first job um but there's no real like one person that's like been like come on I'll teach you everything you need to know kind of stuff like that 
okay, you guys are now at school and you're looking for a job. So let's talk about the job finding process and how many links and applications did you end up sending out before someone responded? And did you guys also engage with any recruiters? I guess Matt can start because you started first. Um, the market right now is, I guess it's a seller's market. People are just looking for people. So because there's so, there's so many job openings and so many really good markets right now. Um, so if you're looking for a job, this is the time to look for one. Um, so honestly, I posted my reels. I have three different reels, a sports, a reporter or sports and MMJ and then an anchor reel posted all of them on YouTube. And it, people reached out to me, news directors saw it, reached out to me and then would, and then I would kind of come through that way, um, for a few, but I think like 10 to 12 reached out to me that way. And then there was a, also a couple where some other MMJs here in Springfield would be like, Hey, we have an opening in another market. They've reached out to me. Maybe you want, might want to reach out to them. Um, and then also through the Sinclair market, I, they, they have kind of a system of upward mobility where you can reach out to other Sinclair stations. And that makes it a lot easier. So I applied to maybe five or six different positions within Sinclair. Overall, I only applied for five jobs, but I had like meetings and like first interviews and like basically face-to-faces with 12 to 12 to 15, um, just trying to find out what their station was about with the pay all that, and positions, all that stuff. But the market right now, it, it's definitely on our side of it, not on the, the news director side of it, just because so many people need reporters and, and anchors and staffing right now. So then you started in Springfield in February 2020, so just right before COVID. So your whole career has been COVID. What has it been like? Yeah, I think my so my seventh day, my first day here was the February 24th, 2020. Um, first COVID-19 case here in Illinois was like January 26th of 2020. So like we didn't really didn't know about it yet. Um, but like I think it was my third week right before St. Patrick's Day when everyone was like, all right, we're shutting it down everything's done and so St. Patrick's Day parades all that stuff got canceled everyone was freaking out um it was it was interesting because like I I don't know reporting in a non-COVID time right now so it's going to be really interesting as we keep going forward how how the news world transitions back to normalcy instead of how does this relate to COVID and does this have a COVID-19 angle so it's been it's been interesting I mean my seventh day here I reported on a plane crash and I think I from what I remember, that's like my last non-COVID story. So. <laughs> okay, so Jordan, you started at 20 in June of 2020. So how did you land, first of all, in Springfield? Did Matt kind of help you with that? Uh, yes and no. Um, I had started kind of looking for jobs. I, I was graduating Arizona State in May. So I started looking for jobs kind of in January, just to kind of look around. I put a reel together. Um, And I hadn't really started applying, but I had posted my reel and I had talked to some different recruiters and I hit it off with a couple of them and the recruiter from Sinclair, which is the company we work for now, Kevin Olivas, Kevin Olivas was saying that um, there were a couple of openings across country that I might be interested in. And one of them was in Springfield, Illinois, because we have Um, kind of a story arc here called Project Illinois and it's more investigative investigative, and it looks into the Department of Children and Family Services which is our child welfare agency and because of a documentary long-form background I really liked the idea of getting into investigative journalism so I had mentioned that to the recruiter and he um said, let me connect you with the news director in Springfield, Illinois. And at that point, Matt and I had been dating for a while. We, we met when we were both doing our master's and he had taken the job in Springfield already. I think I'd been here for like three or four weeks, maybe when the news director walks by me, he's like, do you know Jordan Elder? I'm like, yeah, she's good. She's really good. You should look into hiring her. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So I ended up, um, 
setting up kind of a phone call to talk about what Project Illinois was and what I could potentially learn and contribute to it. And it went really well and I ended up getting hired here. So to be completely honest, this was the only job I applied for because it was a perfect fit for me. It was going to teach me to be an investigative reporter. It was going to teach me to do breaking news. Uh, it was in a city that I liked, like it's, it's got a Walmart, it's got all the things. I was really worried about starting in the middle of nowhere. So I was very excited that it has like stores that I know. Um, and it hurt that Matt was here. I always- um, It'd be when, concerning if it did hurt that I was Yeah, here. I know. But I always um, tell people like him being here was a bonus because this really was the job that I needed and wanted. And him being here was a big plus. That was kind of like the universe assigned to me to be like, yep, this is the one for you. So that's how I landed here. <laughs> I love that story. So uh, so are you an investigative reporter? Or are you doing day turns? Kind of clarify that. So I do everything. I do day turns, but I also do investigative stories. And the way that we have been handling investigative journalism in the world of COVID is it's kind of a chip away model. So instead of doing a really long 10 minute investigative story, we do it in bite sized chunks. So we will hit one angle a day on the same topic, breaking down different things in kind of the form of a series. It's like a continuing coverage. Like model. a continuing coverage. So that way people know they're going to be continuing to do this. They know when they tune in, that's what they're going to see. They're going to get to learn more. And I think that's really helped me because it's taught me how to write a lot faster and you can really spread out the content that you're getting over the course of a couple of days. And I think it makes it more digestible for the viewer too. You don't have to spend 10 minutes watching a story when they might tune out after one, because if you just give them the bite-sized chunk, a lot of times that's all people have the attention span for anyway. I mean, here at least all of the MMJs are true MMJs. We're not, we don't have beats. We don't have specific beats. We don't have an investigative or a capital or anything like that. We're all, you go in, if this is the story you wanna do, you pitch that story. And I mean, we all have kind of our general liking and our, our own focus. That's so maybe we'll stay on one thing and pitch it, but we're not directed to just stay in one thing and pitch it. It gives you the opportunity to try everything. And I really like that because there are some things that I wouldn't have known that I like to do had I had a certain beat or had I been an investigative reporter. like. Agreed. I really love going to breaking news scenes and the the excitement of that and finding the information. I, I do love that. And I wouldn't have known that had I only been an investigative reporter. Yeah, I never would have known that I liked covering politics until I started covering politics here in Illinois in the Capitol, because I, growing up, I was just like, politics are stupid. This is <laughs> inconsequential, blah, 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 blah. And then I moved here and I was like, so this is how the sausage gets made. All right. Well, that's interesting. So let's kind of transition to that, though, because, you know, you mentioned that you wanted to work in sports. So why did you end up making the move to news? Because I know it's a lot of broadcasters that end up doing that. Um, kind of the path of least resistance, I guess. Um, there's a lot of people who want to be in sports, and there's not a lot of people that want to be in news nowadays, even though there's a bazillion news jobs and not a lot of sports jobs. Just for like an, an example, in our master in my master's class, there was 37 sports uh, kids, 30 as a cohort, um, or there's 37 kids, half of them were sports, half of them were news. This year, not three years later, there is two full classes of 70, I think they have 75 and over 40 of them are sports. Everybody wants to get into sports, um, but there's so few sports jobs out there that you really have to be new, exciting, have discernible qualities and just be, and almost sometimes even be right place, right time. And so I have always prided myself on being able to do a little bit of everything. I can do digital, I can do broadcast, I can do news, I can do sports, I can anchor, I can produce, I can do all these things. And so I was like, okay, well, why not go two years? And while I was talking with them about my contract, I was like, hey, I've never done news before. They're like, okay, that's fine. We'll still let you have your hand in, in sports um, when there's a sports story to come up. And actually it worked out really well because because of COVID, so many sports and news stories crossed. Cancellations, 
masking in, on the court, masking on the field, not being able to play, mental health of athletes, all that stuff was able to cross over. So even though I switched over to news, I still have my hand in it. And that's really where my passion lies is with sports. But long story short, I went into news because it was the path of least resistance. It was a way for me to get my foot in the door and maybe switch over to sports later on, maybe not, but at least I was in the industry and having that experience. Okay, so now let's talk about your day to day. So kind of walk us through a day in a life. What are you typically doing when you start your day when you and it just kind of walk us through that for people who don't know. So I'm day side. So I, I usually get into the newsroom about 30 in the morning. And the first thing I do is think about story ideas and send in pitches. So we usually do about three a day. And you um, decide what it is that you want to work on. You think about what the big story is going to be and send in your pitches. And then we have our editorial meeting. So everyone gets together, all the managers, the producers, and the reporters, and we decide who is going to be doing what that day and how it's going to work into the show. So after that, we go and make our calls. We set up our interviews. You go get your video and we'll always take pictures. You also got to take pictures uh, for the web story later. And, I'm really bad at that. <laughs> <laughs> and then you post on social media throughout the day about what you're working on or like funny things that happen. Like the example that always comes to mind for me is like, I, I don't know what it is about my camera bag, but there are always like spiders love my camera bag. So a lot of times I'll post pictures of like, oh my gosh, there's a spider in my camera bag. And since people on social media are also afraid of spiders, it turns into this big conversation starter. Um, so you collect all the pieces of your story we usually do two a day. We'll do a bigger story, which is the package, and then a smaller story, which is the VOSA. Usually they're on completely different things. So you go out, you collect everything. Super fun. Yeah. Write it, put it together. Um, you send it off. We always um, send it through management, through the producers, all the scripts so that they can make them better, tweak them, fact check. We do all of that. And then you edit it, put it together. And our station puts a big emphasis on live shots. So we are live in the five, the 5.30, the six. Sometimes you're cutting a look live. So like a little fake live shot for the late shows. Um, and you come back, put it together and do your web story so that then people, if they don't want to watch the video, they can click the article and they see the pretty pictures you took earlier and they see the Facebook live that you did. Uh, and then you start thinking about stories for tomorrow. Do it all again. Okay, so at the time this is being recorded in February, a good section of the country, including central Illinois, got hit by a major winter storm. So you guys were part of team coverage. Uh, what was that experience like? Because I know, I think Jordan, you told me you guys were working 11 hour days, right? We were right when that snow hit. So we had a day of freezing rain and then two straight days of snowfall. So we got about a foot of snow. And what that looks like for us is like most journalists covering snowstorms, we tell everyone to stay inside and then we go outside. So Matt actually had to drive me to work the first morning that it snowed because my little baby car wasn't going to make it. So he drove me and then he had to come back later that day for his shift. But we would take the news cars four wheel drive. We would go out and get video of the snow and talk to people about it, see what they were doing. Um, Not fun. It was, it's just so cold. And then we were live in pretty every block of the show. So that means you're out, you might be outside for an hour and a half and it's just snowing on you. And in hindsight, it is fun, but in the moment, sometimes you just want to cry because it's so cold. Like I love what I do, but oh my gosh, it was so cold. While the meteorologist is in the, is, is in the newsroom and is in the, uh, in the studio, like it's minus three degrees outside. If you go out for more than 10 minutes, you might get hypothermia and we're out there. Like, it's really, really fun. <laughs> it's me. I have it's it. Me. <laughs> I love that is so important for the community too, because a lot of times people, like if people are staying in their houses and they're like, oh, I wonder what the roads are like, they are gonna turn on the news to see what the roads are like. So if you can give them that update and keep them safe and I, a huge kudos to all the meteorologists too that have to predict that and really are telling people information that could be life or death in such big storms. It really like, it gives you a whole new appreciation being a part of that coverage for what they're doing. Uh, moving on, like many local news personalities from coast to coast, you guys are both not originally from Springfield. So two part question, have viewers been pretty open and accepting or are they quick to call you out on mistakes? Like if you get a town name wrong. 
So yeah, they'll they'll call you out when you get a town name wrong. We have we have some around here that are just Athens is Athens here. New, um, it looks like it should be New Berlin, but it's New Berlin. It's, it's New Berlin. It's New like Berlin. You, you don't pronounce the I. It's just L N. That's just how you need to pronounce it. There's, there's just a couple of things. Ed, Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Yeah, Garden of Eden, but it's pronounced Eden here. Edinburgh. So when you get that wrong, literally not five minutes later, you, a caller or a viewer will call the newsroom and say, um, tell Matt you, it's Edinburgh. Okay. Or they'll message you on Facebook yeah. and say, clearly you're not from here. Oh, God. I mean, and that's fine. Generally, they're very accepting of us as people, mm -hmm. but get the names of the damn towns right apparently so yeah for the most part i feel like the viewers have been really um really kind and accepting of us specifically we um when we got engaged we made the decision that we were gonna be open about it and post about it and let people and the response to that was incredible people were so nice and saying congratulations uh, people will check in, they'll message me on Facebook and say like, how's the wedding planning going? When are you getting married? Can we see the dress? And like, it's, people really do care about your personal life. And I think that that's, that's really sweet because when you move to towns like this for journalism, you really do have to make it your home for however long you're here. And we're very lucky. We do have a lot of viewers who did want to make this home for us. That's great. And that's something I do definitely want to touch on and we'll get to here in a second, but something else I was kind of curious about, you know, being in a new market you're not from originally, has it been hard to kind of find sources for stories? It started out, starting out, yeah. Um, building up the source Rolodex, um, for lack of a better term, was a challenge at first because you don't know anyone. <laughs> so you have to rely on reporters that had been that have been here for a while or anchors that have been here for a while your news director your your assignment editor um anybody like that to be like okay who should i call for this story do you guys know who the mayor is do you know who the county clerk is all this stuff after a while you have people cell phones and you can just call them like i can call the mayor right now and he would probably be like man what's up after uh, that's after being here for two years for the first like three or four months you're just like i have no idea who any of these people are and mm -hmm. it scares me and you definitely have to work for it i feel like especially um with some sources they want to make sure that you know what you're doing and that you're not going to burn them and that you're going to do your job responsibly and so you do have to kind of prove yourself sometimes to make this but once you do um once you do it's definitely I feel like you know that you're doing a good job of that one <laughs> over the course of the time here people have people have one been mad at you and two praised you for your for the work that you've done on the on kind of the same subject and they've been like that's not true and then they've been like that's really true it's kind of like okay well I was fair to you then mm -hmm. that's what I think what people look for is fairness because obviously if you're doing something wrong there's there's going to be coverage about it that doesn't look very good on you but mm -hmm. as long as it's fair and you give everyone the chance to say their piece then usually they're okay do you get viewers that are like call you guys out you guys are like fake news or you guys are biased or they blame the media some people don't even listen to what you say some people just see fox on your jacket and they're like ah this guy's a jerk obviously <laughs> but it's the same type of people that read a headline and think they know exactly what's happening so and a lot of it's not to your face in my experience. Like I've never had someone really come up and like personally tell me that I'm fake news. Sometimes when the people drive in the back of live shots, they'll yell it or they'll comment it on your Facebook, but it's not people who are willing to your face. It's the keyboard warriors who just want to say it to say it. Um, if you, uh, I, I don't know. I feel like people can tell when you're doing your best and when you're doing this stories that really matter there's no reason to call you fake news because people are kind of thankful for what you're doing so i don't know I people, think people, people are do. gonna people are gonna talk crap they want to talk crap that's just yeah people some people just live to there's some you live to point out the mistakes that you make if they think it's a mistake but it's not a mistake some people that live in a in, that live in a town for 30 years that only see something one way and really it's a new set of eyes seeing it a completely different way that's actually spreading light on it but they don't see it that way it's just not everyone's going to agree with what you do. So what is your message to someone who might be listening, like a viewer, whoever, who accused the media or local news of being biased? 
my message for everybody who says even utters the terms fake news is you can say what you want about national media and national syndicates but local news local reporters literally not that <laughs> we're just we're just trying to tell local stories and provide our content and your guys's content to you um it's we have no agenda we don't get told what to write we don't get told how to write it we don't get told what agenda our our, our news station has or any our our company has if, if there is one i've never been told to write something a certain way to reach a certain audience i always that's my biggest message for people who are like no nah, the media doesn't spread light on this i'm like okay well if there's a local angle to it i definitely will my message would be if you feel like the news isn't covering all the perspectives or you think they don't have all the information call them and tell them your perspective call and give them the information because sometimes that's the roadblock is there's a perspective that you want to put out there but if you can't find anyone to talk about it it makes it kind of difficult so news is kind of a team effort between you and the community and if you feel that something isn't being covered the way that you think it should be reach out there's a lot of people that'll call the station and be like hey you guys should look into this this and this and then they'll say well are you willing to talk on camera about this like no no, no, no i can't do that I'm like well i don't know what you want us to do then buddy <laughs> exactly okay so something you guys are going to have a lot of opinions on so you're both mfjs so okay for those who don't know what that is you're basically shooting your own video reporting it fronting it rewriting it for the web, editing it. So since you're both MFJs, we kind of do want your thoughts on on, on what it's like being an MFJ, but I'm, you guys both know about the reporter who got hit doing their live shot uh, by a car in the air and they were doing their live shot solo. So what was your takeaway from that? What were your opinions on that? And do you think newsrooms kind of need to, I guess, enhance safety protocols? So one thing that I think we should just say right off the bat is our news station makes it a priority that for any time that you're going live you have a photographer with you we're very lucky with that. we are very lucky it's for safety it's been that way since we both started it'll be like that after we leave because safety is a huge huge deal to our management and i i can't imagine it any other way like we we are mmjs in the sense that we will go get our own video we do our own interviews we put it together for the most part, you are a one man band, but if you are going to be live in a situation where you can't fully be aware of your surroundings, someone else is absolutely with you. And even sometimes just going to get video, if you're in a part of town, that's not great. Or if you're nervous about going to do something, they will send another photographer with you, or at least just another person so that you have someone kind of watching. So you're not alone. Last week we did uh, live shots for weather and there was two of us watching two of us behind the camera and one person on air. I went, I went with a photog in Jordan to do her live shots for an hour and a half because it can be dangerous outside with people sliding around and not, not really paying attention or if the reporter's not paying attention, watching behind them or something, it can be dangerous. So they sent out three of us for one person to be on air those times. So, mm -hmm. um, in my opinion on the industry, it's the industry as a whole has gone and i mean not just our industry multiple industries have gone to how much can one person do and so we don't have to pay two people um is that good maybe for them but not really for the reporters or the mmjs or whoever's out there doing the work um but there but there's also the the mindset of Bill Gates always gave the hardest tasks to the laziest people because they would do it the most efficient, efficiently. Mm -hmm. You give, if you give someone as much as they can handle, they'll tell you when they can't handle it. And then you're like, okay, we've learned this is what to expect now out of MMJs. So, I mean, it's the industry is kind of moving to a, to a, a kind of mind of how much work can one person do and how can we do this with less people? And so, I mean, it, and it sucks sometimes, but I feel like if you know your own limits, then it doesn't wear on you as much as it can. And I think the next generation of journalists that's coming up is less nervous to speak up for themselves. Obviously, I, I'm in that generation, so I don't really know what it was like before, but I feel like just from what I've seen 
on social media, my friends in the industry, people will speak up if they don't feel safe doing something, if they need help, they will speak up because it's, it's easier to, to be safe, let somebody know what's going on, as opposed to then regretting it and potentially being in an unsafe situation. Overall, with MMJing, I really do like it. I like to be in charge of my story and shooting the video and kind of doing it um, exactly how I'm picturing it in my head. Uh, I, I always tell people, like, I never really played team sports growing up. I didn't really know what it was like to be on a team. So I do thrive <laughs> as an MMJ just because I can do everything myself. But um, I do think that safety wise, it is smart to have two people, at least for live shots, um, or even if it's not a very reporter photographer, just sometimes having another person there is very helpful. And I don't know whether that's going to be feasible industry wide change just based on the staffing issues that we're seeing industry wide right now. But I would like to see this caution continue through the next couple weeks, months, years, because I feel like more will be drawn to this industry if they don't have to be nervous about going out to do their jobs every day. Well, the industry as a, as a whole has changed. You see people going out and Facebook living news conferences with their phone and a tripod now. And, the, and phones are, have become so advanced that they're better than half the cameras that people use anyways. So, I mean, it's like MMJing is almost like a new thing because it came from, from these from people who are just taking their phones and going to press conferences or going to events and live streaming it from there. And then people learned like, oh, you, you can do this by yourself. And it's like, yeah, we can, but those people aren't training packages and stuff. So. It was a good conversation starter, I think. And I, I am so, so thankful that she was okay because I feel like this would be a different conversation um, had she not been okay. And I, I'm, I'm really glad just like my fellow MMJ sister was okay with that, but um yeah, that, it was such a crazy situation. And then last question on the topic, why do you think there's a there's many people in the industry who do not like MMJs? I know quite a few. Because it's a lot. It is a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of satisfaction with it because you can when something airs, you can say, I literally shot that, I edited that, I voiced that, wrote that, took the pictures that were in there. I set up all the interviews. I did that. That's something that was my work but it is a lot. It's a lot of work. It is. And I think it causes a lot of stress. And especially I feel like if you're at a station that doesn't have a ton of resources or you're understaffed, it feels like there is a lot of weight that falls on MMJs. And a lot of times MMJs are people who are brand new to the industry. They don't have the, the experience and the resources to fall back on when they are overwhelmed and they need help. So I, I don't, even if the industry doesn't move away from MMJing, I think that it does need to move toward more resources for MMJs to make sure that no matter if you are understaffed, no matter how many stories you're doing a day, you've got a support system and you've got people looking out for you because it, it's a lot of weight on your shoulders. Okay, so let's kind of change the topic somewhat and talk about doing live shots. I know, of course, you mentioned having a photographer, but you I think you both have mentioned to us that you've had people try to crash your live shots. So what are some examples and how do you react to that? I don't think there's ever been a situation where someone has physically interrupted my live shot. But a lot of times when I'm out in the field, no matter if there's a photographer or not, some people are just rude and some people are just Gross. gross like I as a, as a female it has been very educational working in this industry because just because you are kind of a public figure and you're out there in the world people think they can say whatever they want to you no matter how offensive it is or vulgar people will just come up and do it they don't care if your camera's running uh, and that's something that I've definitely had to get used to I grew up in the Midwest I feel like people in the Midwest are very respectful um, but I have had some pretty disrespectful things said to me just doing my job. And that's something that other industries don't really have to worry about as much. Like, I feel like you don't have to worry about getting catcalled or touched or like just people interrupting you doing your job and other things. Like there was a, I was shooting in a location that 
I thought was going to be completely safe. There was no reason to think that it was going to be anything bad. And this man came up to me. I was just shooting video of a building. And this, this homeless man came up to me and said, oh, you're that girl from the news and tried to grab my face. And so I immediately pushed away and I grabbed my camera. I was out of there. And it's, it's just things like that, like very unprovoked or like when I'm shooting, I'm close to my news car so that I can get out if I need to. And a man came up, I was putting my gear in the trunk and he tried to kind of box me into the trunk so that I had to keep talking to him and he was getting really close to me. And people just have a lot of, a lot of guts <laughs> to try to do stuff like that. And it does make you uncomfortable and shake you up a little bit, but it's, it's just one of those things that I wasn't expecting <laughs> when I came into the industry to have to deal with, but I feel lucky that at least uh, where we work, they do give you the resources to get out of those situations and to not even get in them in the first place if you have multiple people. Yeah, we're told um, one, photographer should always keep the camera rolling. Uh, two, if you feel threatened, screw the live shot, get the hell out of there. Yeah. At the first sign of anything going wrong, they encourage you leave, to leave. Leave. They don't, they don't care if your live shot's up or not, if it's up to your safety. So, which, like I said, we're lucky with that. I mean, a lot of what I've experienced, I got, I wasn't during a live shot, but I was out shooting and stuff. This was during the Black Lives Matter um, protests when uh, a lot of that was going on. I mean, I got, people saw just the Fox logo on the car and picked up a piece of cement and threatened to hit me with it or throw it through the car window. Um, someone drove up today, just like literally like I'm doing a live shot here and someone drove up like right here. And yeah, I, someone pulled up like, 10 yards behind me and maybe 10 feet behind me and just started it was, like, it was like oh fox news let's talk i was like hi um also people don't i i don't think anything in the world annoys me more than when people honk during a live shot in springfield i'm jordan elder back to you it makes no sense like I can't, I can just imagine people, I can just imagine people going home and being like, all right, let's turn on the five o'clock news. Let's see if, let's see if my honks in there. These surgical masks actually contain a type of the material that's running low. It helps filter out germs and virus particles, which is why it's so important. Okay. Can we do one more? <laughs> okay. Do, okay. Really? Okay. I'm going to punch that guy. For what? Three, two, one. These surgical masks actually contain... Nope, that wasn't it. Three, two, one. Like, cool. But it's a honk. Anyone could take credit for that. Yeah, I mean, also, there was, there was one time uh, I was at the... Uh, on the north end of town, it was the Illinois Department of Corrections. And I was doing a live shot there, and this one car drove by... And then I saw the drive coming. Then they went around and they came by again. And this time, window was rolled down. So I was like, ah, oh, here we go. So they yelled, F her right in the. F Sorry. Um, they, yelled, they yelled that. And I was like, okay. Like, we weren't live yet. We were five minutes before the live show. I was just set up. So then they went around again, yelled it again. And then I saw them come, coming around, but then they turned because they lived right on that corner. And so. I did my live shot. They didn't know it wasn't on air or anything, but I did my live shot. We were setting up and we were just like getting back in the car for the next live shot or to, to pass the time before the next one. The two kids, they were teenagers came by and they were like, did you guys hear me? I was like, yeah. He's like, was it on the news? I was like, no. He's like, ah, oh, but it was funny, huh? I was like, no. If you have to ask if it was funny, it's not funny. Like, no, you're just an idiot. I think a lot of viewers are going to notice that a lot of the people they see on the news are getting younger. And obviously you guys are a proof of that. So wh why do you think that's the case? Cause it used to be like Springfield. It was a market where it was probably going to be more like a second or third job. Why do you think the industry has changed in that direction of younger talent? I don't know if I could really pinpoint a why. Um, but I think there are a lot of younger people who are, are wanting to get in to the industry and things have changed to the point where you can move up and you can start in places that you couldn't before. And I think part of it might be that the younger generations are just so uh, tech savvy and you could probably hand any teenager 
a phone these days with iMovie or TikTok and they could probably figure out how to do a package. And I don't know. Just become we're working on it. Because of that, I think that uh it's it's just easier to move up in that way and you're able to get these skill sets um and move up or start places that like 20, 30 years ago would have been unimaginable. Yeah, I feel like you're just starting the education like if you go to a right, the right place you just know so much like I feel like I came into the came into this knowing a lot of things obviously I've learned a lot in my first two years in the industry but I, I feel like I was prepared to to get a job in this market um and I hit kind of hit the ground running with the education that I had um but, and a lot of people kind of feel that way and then how's it like working with people around your age? Do you learn anything from them at all? Or do you feel like it's more relatable working with people around your age? I've learned a lot from people like Jordan. Jordan teaches me something every day, pretty much. Jordan's better than me, but that's just what happens um, when you're a child prodigy. Um, <laughs> He's ridiculous. Uh, I No, I mean, I've, I learned from my coworkers all the time. And then a lot of times, at least station um in stations around our area there's the anchors teach you a lot as well because they had been in your shoes and then they have now gotten out of your shoes and you're what you want to be in theirs so i've learned a lot from the anchors i've learned a lot from of, about writing from our producers and our news director and our assistant news director i've learned a lot about how to shape a story and all that stuff so i mean you learn a lot if you want to you should be learning every day when you go to work I don't think it really matters how old people are or how long they've been around. Like everyone has such a, a specific skill set that they're good at that you, you could learn something from everybody if you really wanted to. And we have a very team environment. Like I know that if I need help with writing, I could go ask someone. If I want to shoot something more creatively, there's people that I can go ask about that and they'll help you. They'll just do it. And everyone wants to help make you better. I think that's a real Really important environment. If there are people listening to this who are looking for a newsroom to join, make sure you go somewhere with people who are going to help you grow because this can be a very competitive industry, but there's no need to compete with the people that you're working with. You're all, you all have the same end goal. So make sure you're finding a place that has people who are willing to build you up and teach you things. I disagree with that a little bit. I, I'm competitive with everybody. <laughs> I think if you, like, I think it, helps the newsroom environment for you for me to want to be better than Jordan for me to want to do a better story than Jordan because then she'll look at my story and be like okay well I want to do better than that tomorrow so like an internal competitiveness isn't a bad thing I agree like healthy competition yeah. though, not toxic competition no not like big difference not like f that guy his story yeah killed mine or he stole that story from me because he wanted the glory nothing like that but just like I want to do better than them yeah because I just want to be better I would agree with that let's turn our attention now to social media so this is a big reason why i want to have you on when i was looking for people you know well coming across reels and stuff and i i liked your work obviously but i saw it on social media you guys are both very genuine uh don't take yourselves too seriously but you also you know we still get the news from your accounts and all that so uh let's talk about how how important do you guys feel it is to be yourself on your social media do you think viewers notice yes I think being yourself and being genuine is everything because people, I, I like, I feel like it would be just kind of weird if all I posted was news because then people think I was a robot, but I am a real person. I have a real dog. He's my neighbor. Nursuk tam tuliak bai. It's pain in my assholes. I get a window from a glass. You must get a window from a glass. I get a step. I'm a really awful cook. We have not done a cooking with Jordan in a while. And so I figured what better night to do one than when I'm making something that I have literally never made before and that I'm probably going to do a lot of guesswork on. Uh, but to be fair, that's kind of just what I do every night. So, and there's things that I want to share with people because it's relatable. So I, I knew that that's the route that I wanted to take when I went into this industry is for people to know that I am a real person. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I share everything on social media, but I share enough so that I'll know if I have things in common with the viewers and they'll get kind of an inside look into my life. And I think a big part of it too is the behind the scenes of our job as well. People are so interested 
in how we do what we do and what goes into putting that broadcast on TV. And I love doing stuff like that. And like blooper videos, I love doing those. Dot. Like a rotisserie chicken. They've already replaced about a quarter of the street lights in uh, Springfield, not Kansas City. Because nobody's perfect, why pretend? I just love I that. I mean, one thing that I, it kind of stuck with me, I watched, like I said earlier, I watched Mike and Mike for a long time for during their 20 year run um, of TV. And one, one thing that I always admired about those two guys was fam family was a big part of their show and bringing in the family, being relatable and knowing who they were and why they do what they do. And I feel like I was just like, I really connected with that because it was such a smart way to go about one being a TV personality, but two being a genuine feeling like who you're watching is a genuine, nice human being. And, and I mean, that's just one thing I always wanted to do when I was, if I became a personality or if I became a, a reporter or whatever I was going to do, I'm not a closed off person in general. Anyway, I can, tell you tell anybody anything that they want to know so i mean i <laughs> social media for me was just like okay well if people are interested in then let's love let's tell them who i am uh, so like i mentioned uh, earlier you guys are obviously very positive so how do you mean how do you manage to stay upbeat and positive especially with everything happening in the industry and some of the stories you have to cover i know you're like going out to fires or shootings or stuff right so does that ever get to you and how do you avoid you know feeling burnt out when i first got hired here i told them i want to still have my hand in sports because a lot of that a lot of that sense of it is like that's my chance to decompress from a shooting or something like or covid and death and despair and all that stuff a lot of times you do a sports story and it's a kid who came from the projects who didn't have a chance to get a scholarship and now he's going on a full ride and it's a really happy story a lot of the times i mean kind of got invaded with covid and all that stuff but um otherwise outside of work i do a much better job than jordan does at disconnecting work and home like when i'm not at work don't call me on my work phone it's not it's just not gonna happen i'm just not in that zone i'm not in that frame of mind maybe if i see a press release or something i'll send it i'll send an email out but i do a much better job at disconnecting from work while i'm not there and that because that's my chance to recharge i'm not very good at that and yeah. I'll, I'll absolutely admit that it's just one of those things i am working on it because i know that's not sustainable long term especially with with the industry that we're in i for me the staying positive I just, I really do love my job. And I know that sounds cheesy, but this is the only thing that I can imagine myself doing. And so even on the hard days, I feel like you learn something. And if you have been doing a lot of death and despair stories, for me, what kind of gets me out of that rut is doing the off the wall stories that like, they're still hard news, but there's an opportunity to shoot them really creatively, or there's a character involved that is really nice someone that you haven't talked to before who's funny who just kind of ties the story together I think that there's little things throughout the day throughout the stories that you can do to make it more positive for yourself and it helps that we've got a great team around us who helps with that too but you just you have to find what works for you and the stressful thing about this industry is it that can be really difficult for some people the disconnecting and the fact that it is kind of hard sometimes with all of the the sad things that you have to cover and not everybody can separate that and that's okay but it is something that you have to learn and there are days where I do feel burnt out and I come home and I I don't want to look at news I don't want to think about it but every day is a new day that's the best part of this job is you do something different every day and there's a new opportunity to learn, to meet people. And it's, for me, it's easy to stay positive if you go into it with that mindset. Okay. So you mentioned you love your job. So do you guys ever see yourself stepping out of TV? Or are you both pretty set on TV? Cause I know we're seeing like a great resignation and all that of people from the industry. For me, I really can't see myself doing anything else. I love TV news. If I were to change or do anything else, I still think it would be news related. I, I still have been kind of pulled toward that documentary style. I still believe that I don't have a place in every single story. There are some stories that the characters can tell it better than I can. 
And eventually I think I would like to continue either producing documentaries or helping out with those just because that is a passion of mine, especially if that story is so powerful that it can be told all on its own. But I think I will always be involved with TV and media in some way. I will probably also stay involved in TV and media, but I will not be in TV news my whole life. I want to get out uh, and go teach. I want to go out and get my doctorate at some point, preferably back at Cronkite, but you know, we'll see. Um, I want to, I don't know. I feel like I have a passion to teach people what I have learned and how I can help them mold the next or how I can then help mold the next generation of journalists. Um, and that's something I really want to do when I get older and get the experience to be able to impart that kind of wisdom on, on them. Plus someone's going to have to stay home with the kids while Jordan's are out conquering the world. So that'll be a little easier. You guys are both very young in your early twenties. So do either of you even watch local news outside of work? And why do you think people from your generation are just avoiding local news at all? It gets a bad rap news media in general just gets a bad rap plus there's a there's so many other forms of news that are so many other forms of media that aren't local news now that are more um fun. Not, i'm not going to say fun but like that's the term that's coming to mind is fun like just for example there's a new sports con concept in phoenix called the P phnx and it's just a kind of an off the wall different storytelling, different way of giving people sports news in, in Phoenix. And they have one in Denver as well. And it's like the younger generation, um, people my age, I'm 26 or younger, kind of gravitate towards a non-traditional style of storytelling. Uh, and I think that's kind of one of the things that our industry as a whole needs to more closely adapt is kind of a non-traditional storytelling medium accepting things like TikTok, which I have yet to do, and um, <laughs> shorter stories and things of that nature where you can tell the news, but in a way that can get people's attention. I agree. I think that a lot of the focus in the next few years and decades is not going to be what can we do to make our five o'clock newscast fantastic it's going to be can we get to streaming services how can we get people this content in a way that they will see it whether that be through social media or from more off the wall methods and I think it's going to take a lot of creativity and that's what I'm really excited about is we did just enter into an industry that's going to change a lot and there's a very real chance that the jobs that we end up with and stay with for 10 years don't exist yet it's changing every day I think that's so exciting that we get to kind of be there and experience how this industry changes, because I think it'll be for the better. I think that this is the generation of people in news that can make people trust it again and make people interested in it again. We just have to go about it the right way. All right. Well, let's end with some lighter questions. So what are some of like the behind the scenes, like secrets that viewers might not realize? I'm not talking about like, you know, proprietary information or your salaries, nothing like that. <laughs> but and like secrets, like viewers may not realize, like, for example, you know, I was looking and I saw that like you, you will stand on a step stool sometimes during your live shots. Oh, that was pretty interesting. Oh, always. I'm always on a step stool. Matt's not. Matt doesn't have the height issue that I do. <laughs> I just use stilts. Yeah. Matt is like six five, six six. Max is really tall, and I am not. So I have a step stool that comes with me wherever I go, and that's how I do my live shots. And there have been so many people that walk by on the street when I'm doing my live shots, and they go, "Oh, Mike Murphy. you're a much taller person." Yeah, one of our state representatives was driving past one day as I was doing my live shot, and he called me. And he goes, "Are you on a milk crate? What are you standing? What are you doing?" And I was like, "I'm just not tall enough. Like it looks better if I stand up here." So I think people don't realize that. Um, and I think people don't realize too with MMJs that you're doing it all yourself. I've walked into so many interviews with all my camera gear. And I, if I had a dollar for every time someone said, where's your cameraman? It's me. I'm here. I am the cameraman. <laughs> and a lot, oh. of, a lot of people don't get that. 
Welcome to a day in the life of a multimedia journalist. First up, we have our pitch meetings in the morning, which is where we give our ideas and figure out what story we're going to be working on. Then you set up your interviews, do all your research, then we have to go out and get video for the story. So here I am making sure the camera is all set up and ready to go. Today we're doing a story about abandoned houses, so that's where we are. Then you take everything you got out in the field and you write your script and then send that into the producers to get it approved and make sure everything looks right. Then you have to record your voice to put into the story. Then it's time for my favorite part, which is editing everything together. And yes, we do that ourselves. Here's a little snip of what that looks like. And here's what it looks like when the system crashes. But you know what? It's okay. We ended up getting everything done. Then we head out for live shots. I am an MMJ, but we're really lucky. We get photographers with us for every single live hit. So this is Jackson. He got everything set up, got the lighting right. Look at that. It's like it's daytime outside. So we usually go live once every half hour in three different shows. So we did all of our live hits and headed back to the station where it's time for the done bun. This is what that live shot ended up looking like. Beautiful. We get that attached to the web story and transfer that script over so it becomes an article. And then I gather my unnecessary amount of items and I head out for the day. And then you get ready to do it all again. Um, let's debunk some rumors. The camera does not add 10 pounds. I, that's all me. I have 10 pounds extra. Um, we don't read off of a prompter all the time. Ad living's really big. Um, I'm trying to think of other. What are some other stereotypes for TV people? Stereotypes? Um, do you guys ever get the, you don't do, do you guys do your own makeup and hair? Or do you have people that oh do God. it for you? I have, I, I wear makeup, it's just powder and I don't even buy it myself. Jordan buys it for me, mm -hmm. but he's I do apply really, it myself. He's gotten really good at putting it on too. He's I getting have, better. It, it evens out. It's really nice. Yes. But yeah, a lot of people don't know that we, we do all of that ourselves. I think a lot of people don't understand the concept of contracts. Um, oh yeah, that's very. In oh, yeah. TV news, when we started working here, um, Matt especially came in at a time where he was one of the only reporters, just because of how the contract cycle worked, and everyone was so. A lot of the viewers were offended. They were like, "Everyone leaves us. They don't like mm -hmm. us." But it's because they don't understand that most of the news industry runs on contracts you're there for a set amount of time and then you either stay or you go it has nothing to do with with the viewers or the station like that's just kind of how it is and so that's something that I really admire about Matt is he has like when he announced that he was leaving um I'll let you kind of explain but he he made sure everyone knew that he was not leaving because he didn't like them yeah well I so I it was the last week I, I announced that I was I didn't announce where I was going yet but I announced where I was or that I was leaving at the end of my contract which is on February 23rd and I made sure in there to be and I and I for a very specific reason I didn't put I'm leaving this is where I'm going I wanted to show appreciation for where I am now and the people that have helped me over the over these two years and all the sources that we've built up and all the lovely wonderful people that I've interviewed and all that stuff and basically say thank you and this isn't because of you guys that's just that's just how our industry is yeah. it's two years and then you move and you find somewhere you want to settle at least springfield somewhere i want to settle no but that's nothing based on them it's not, it's not their fault so it leads in well to my next question so as i mentioned at the time this is airing probably in the spring or summer you're not in springfield any, anymore so kind of tell us where you're headed to and what's next well depending on where this airs or when this airs i will be i'll have already been in san antonio i'm moving to san antonio in two weeks from today actually um from the day from what is it february 10th so yeah actually exactly two weeks from today i will literally be getting in my car to drive to san antonio 16 hours straight let's do it on any given night here in san antonio you'll see hundreds of drivers taking people and food where it needs to go. But with gas prices now reaching near $4 a gallon within San Antonio limits, some drivers are saying enough is enough. Dry, arid conditions throughout the state are causing much of West and Southern Texas to look like this, with dead trees, drying bushes, and grass that sounds like this, causing many experts to sound the alarm. For now in Stairtown, I'm Matt Roy. Back to you. News 4 San Antonio, I'm Matt Roy. So all have already been in San Antonio. We are both I'm going to be a general assignment reporter, um, so I won't have to be MMJ anymore. I won't have to go shoot and all that stuff. I'll still be with them, but I won't be the one doing it. Um, 
I don't think they even have MMJs at 429. Right? They, they do. They, okay. they have a couple. They have a couple. Not, not a lot, but they have a couple. Um, Jordan is all – that's just me. Jordan's only talking about it. Okay. But I'll be, in, I'll be in San Antonio. I'll be your next-door neighbor, Jim. What is something you two wish you were told before getting into the industry that you would tell others so they're not making the same mistakes? It's worth it, but it's going to suck sometimes. I just think that every job sucks sometimes, but if your priorities are in the right spot, then you're going to be happy with what you're doing because especially with local journalists, you do make a difference. I would say speak up for yourself, whether it's your safety or it's uh, the, the things that viewers, sources, management is, is saying to you you have a voice, you are the voice for your community, but you're also the voice for yourself and you need to, to speak up if you need help because that's the only way that change will get made is if you speak up. Yeah, if you feel uncomfortable doing something, if you know that it's too much for you, you your news director and your bosses are going to give you as much work as you can handle and you need to know what you can handle before you before you start signing checks that your ass can't catch, can't cash. So, I mean, only you know what you can do. But in that, in that same vein, you do need to push yourself and find out what you can do because we've, we've found out we can do a lot. Yeah, so. learn your limits, but then respect your limits. Yep. You're much better at one-liners than me. I'm trying. This is going to be fun. Let's talk about what it's like working as a couple in a news. So I know you guys mentioned that Arizona, you met at Arizona State, but, and you guys started dating before, but what's it like dating your coworker, both personally and professionally? Uh, professionally, I learn a lot from Matt. Matt's very good at what he does. And he transitioned from sports to news very seamlessly and I definitely looked up to him as a reporter when I started here and I still do I think that his brain works in a way that mine doesn't when it comes to writing and constructing a story and professionally I like I feel really lucky that I get to work with him and learn from him uh where we've never been on the same shift we don't mm -hmm. usually work very closely together but it is cool to be in the same newsroom in that same vein we learned very quickly that we shouldn't work the same shift yeah, I didn't mind it. Matt didn't like working with me. I need, my, <laughs> I need, my, I need some space. Which is fine. And personally, I love you and all. I know you do. But. I love you too. But personally, it, it's nice to have someone who understands it. Like if I have a bad day because of something a source said to me or if a story didn't pan out exactly the way that I wanted it to, Matt completely understands and he gets it. And I can use all of my journalism slang. And he knows exactly what I'm talking about. I can just go riff about like B-roll and packages and bosots and he, he follows me, which is nice because my family does not. And there's, I mean, there are some like negatives, I guess, because a lot, so much of your life does revolve around work, especially when we work separate shifts. She goes in at 9.30, she gets off at 6.30. I get, a, I go in at 1.30, one, uh, get off at 10.30. By the time I get home, we get like an hour together and then go to sleep. Uh, and so much of our conversation sometimes is directed around, oh, how was this source today? Who'd you talk to today? How was your story today? Blah, 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 blah. So sometimes it's nice to just be like, all right, let's talk about one thing that's not News Channel 20, Fox Illinois, or some something involved in media. In which case, then Jordan says, did you know Tristan Thompson's a jerk? Or that Kylie Jenner did this today. And then I'll just be like, all right, we can talk about work again. It's fine. <laughs> Kylie Jenner had a baby. It was big news. <laughs> She called me on the golf course one time, like three times at just in a row. I was playing golf with my buddy, AJ, who's a morning anchor here, three times in a row. And I'm like, I was just about to tee off. I was like, AJ, can you answer this? It's probably important, I, but I need to tee off. And so she, he answers. He's like, hey, are you okay? What's going on? And she's like, I just need to talk to Matt. I'm like, okay. So I tee off and I shank it because I'm worried. And so I go over to my phone. I'm like, are you okay? She's like, the baby's his or something of that nature. I was like, what? Tristan Thompson. It's his baby. Oh, is that what you had to tell me? That's why you called me three times? I was like, yeah. All right, I'll talk to you later. It was big news in my world. It's not big news. And in the world, just not you. 
All right. So congratulations to you both in your engagement. When's the big day? Have you guys pinpointed a day yet? 12-4-22. Yeah. So end of this year, we're going to do a winter wedding and we're going to we'll get married in Kansas City, which is where I'm from, because at the time that we got engaged, we didn't know where we would be when we got married, just with the way that our contracts were. And it's very difficult to plan a wedding when you don't know where you're going to be living. So we just yeah. pinpointed Kansas City and said, let's go for it. And then you guys are pretty open with your NFL fandom that you're a big Chiefs fan and he's a big Broncos fan. So what's that living like? Well, lately, it's great for me because my team is really good. <laughs> my team has been better for longer, so it's fine. But it's so funny, like with, with the way that the viewers interact with that too, because Broncos is such a, like it is such a rivalry. Uh, so when our teams play each other, we get so many viewer messages like, are you watching? What do you think? Do you guys have a bet on it? Like they get so invested in how we watch those games. The entire time that her and I have been together, the Broncos have sucked and the Chiefs have been really good. So it's been really fun. Her dad gives me crap all the time so it's it's super fun I'm a, I'm a good sport about it usually mm -hmm. usually usually I'm a pretty good sport about it but I mean and I, and I never thought I would but I root for the Chiefs now just a, like if they're not playing the Broncos I'll, I'll I'll hope that they win unless it's against a bet that I have but you know and then you guys are both currently in central Illinois so what are some things or places you miss back from home that you can't get up in central Illinois in Springfield the weather <laughs> i'm from southern california it's it's like 60 degrees 65 degrees and sunny today there's no snow coverage there's in no Palm snow Springs. <laughs> there's 119 golf course there's 119 golf courses there they've had the uh, and then in phoenix it's they're having the waste management right now which is probably the most fun golf tournament i've ever attended so it's those are the things i miss it's just probably the weather so the mexican food actually too because it's phenomenal down there but i miss the barbecue in Kansas City. I miss a barbecue in Kansas City. I really City too. do. It's been so interesting starting during the pandemic too, because I feel like we couldn't really explore central Illinois for the longest time. Like I had been here for probably a year before I started going to some of the famous places because everything was closed for COVID. So part of me, like I, I'm almost not excited to move on from here because I feel like I haven't seen everything because of COVID. I haven't gotten to really experience all of it. That's fair. And then you did mention the barbecue. So something we asked to all of our people who have ties to Kansas City or work in it. So where should people go if they're there? If people go to Kansas City, um, you, you really can't go wrong. I'll say that first. Joe's. We, we love Joe's Barbecue. Um, it looks like a gas station, but it's a barbecue place and it is phenomenal. It's the best. We also love Q39 what did you like there the burnt ends burnt end, the yeah. burnt ends at q39 Phenomenal. um i love jack stack lc's is like a smaller um kind of lesser known place for barbecue but it's delicious i just you really can't go wrong so good all of it it's just so good mm -hmm. matt was kind of skeptical at first because i was, I was i was hyping up kansas city barbecue and so then we started trying all of the places and he was like this is incredible it's incredible now let's play a little game before we go. It's just 10 questions. These are just basic questions about uh, just basically your background so people can kind of get to know you both better. Just tell us what your favorite color. Sparkles. It's not a, it's not a color. Yes, it is. Not a color. Green. All right, where were you guys born? Kansas City, Missouri, St. Luke's Northland Hospital. My mom will say Santa Clara, but San Jose. California. All right. How many siblings you guys have? Three. One. Almost four, because I'm gaining his sister. Almost five. Almost four then, because I'm gaining her hooligans. Right. Hobbies in your spare time? Kardashians, reading, coloring, Zumba. Mine pretty much all revolve around sports. Whether that's video, whether that's video games, watching, reading, betting, all of that. You guys have any pets? We have the cutest little <laughs> mutt named Dexter, and he sheds like a monster, but he is so lovable. Come here, bud. Here, lure the camera. Listeners are Hi, Look at him. 
Hey, bud. We post pictures of him all the time. If the listeners if anyone does follow us him. on social, he's on there pretty much every he's other so day. So cute. All right, favorite TV show you guys are not on. <laughs> you shelf me at five. Um, <laughs> my favorite TV show of all time, Time and Your Mother. I love. Keeping up with the Kardashians. I love no, I love The Office more than I love Keeping Up with the Kardashians. But lately, I have been uh, Love Is Blind on Netflix is such a good show. Okay, favorite type of music? Country. Rap. <laughs> right, favorite movie? We're getting Sarah Marshall. Tangled. You guys have a favorite book? The Running Man. Um, and then there were none by Agatha Christie. And then finally, what is one thing most people would be surprised to learn about you? I'm terrified of fish. Eating them, seeing them. Everything. Everything. She I don't like. Fish. I don't trust them. Mom had a fish tank. I'm really, I'm really into rom coms and like those reality TV shows. Most of them, not keeping up with the Kardashians. My, I grew, I was basically raised by my mom, my grandma, and my sister, so I'm very in tune with rom coms and my sensitive side. Um, and then secondly, I had another thing in my head, but I forgot it. Oh. Never mind. That's it. <laughs> Anything else that we did not ask you that you wanted to mention? As difficult as the industry is and as much crap as media gets, I, I wouldn't, I can't think of being in another industry. I love telling stories. I love talking to people um generally i love making a difference and i feel like i can accomplish all those things in this industry i mean there, yes there's things that everyone wants to fix about every industry but i think if you have a good attitude and you're positive and you know your limits and you work hard then you can accomplish a lot and you can make a difference in the world in this industry and that's something i wouldn't give up well said if anyone listening wants to connect with you on social media, where do they need to go to do that? Twitter and Facebook is at Matt Roy underscore TV. Actually, I think I'm on there on Instagram too, at Matt Roy underscore TV. My Twitter and Instagram are Jordan Elder TV and my Facebook is Jordan Elder TV as well. And my TikTok is Jordan Elder TV. We're working on that one. <laughs> I refuse to download TikTok. Expect big things from the Jordan Elder TV TikTok. I've been featured on her TikTok, but I refuse to download the app. He watches Instagram Reels. It's so annoying. He'll like watch the TikToks two weeks late on Instagram Reels, but refuses to download it. Okay, here's my logic. There's, It's not logical. It's literally logical. Every single time I'm like, no, I, I watched Instagram Reels. People are like, it's the same thing. Thank you. It's the same thing. Why would I download another app? I this refuse. is one of our biggest arguments, and we're airing it out for your listeners. TikTok and Instagram Reels. I refuse. Well, we don't want to put any more of your secrets out there for our listeners. So we just want to thank you guys so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Great interview. I love what you guys are doing here. It's so cool. Agreed. Thank you for letting us be part of it. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you for joining us for Broadcast Bolton. New episodes are out on... I don't know if it's Thursday or Monday, but we're going to have them out sometime every week. Starting next week, we'll start new episodes on Apple, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and others. See, I'm doing really bad at this because Jacob's usually the one who closes us out. If you're listening <laughs> on Apple Podcasts. You're killing uh, it. Thanks. If you, and see, I always wanted to be a producer. I never really wanted to be on air, but. Anyway, if listening on Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star review. Uh, that way more can find the podcast because not a lot of people know about it. Uh, and then we're on YouTube because uh, we do have video. If you want to see how all of us look, we do have a video version at youtube.com slash broadcast bulletin. So we're on there. Please you subscribe. Website is broadcastbulletinpodcast.com. Instagram's at broadcast bulletin. And the latest information news is going to be on there. I'm Jim Stanton. Jacob Bricks is not with us, but thank you for listening. See you next time. The views and opinions expressed by the guests in this episode of Broadcast Bulletin are solely theirs. They do not reflect those of their past or present employers, nor those of Broadcast Bulletin or its hosts in any way.
What are you looking at me for? You go. You get hassled more than I do. And going through the industry, I've, I've learned. <coughs> Excuse me. Cut. Yeah, hold on. 